So then we're already at the last talk of this first part of the post-quantum session. So moving back from SIDH back to lattices. Uh, so that this talk is about differential fault attacks on deterministic lattice signatures. So this is a work by Leon groot Brandering and Peter Pessel. And Peter will give the talk. Thank you for the introduction. So it's probably not a well-kept secret anymore that uh, many digital signature schemes are susceptible to non-reuse. Uh, so if you sign two different messages uh, using the same nonce, and you can then easily recover the secret key, and this happened in the past. Uh, a solution to this problem is to make the whole uh, signature scheme completely deterministic. So instead of using a random nonce, you derive it by uh, hashing uh, uh, the message M together with some secret K. And that's what's actually already done in add DSA and deterministic easy DSA. Now, this is all nice, but it also opens a problem that of differential fault attacks. Namely, you can sign the same message M uh, here, same message M twice. This means you will get the same nonce, it's deterministic, and then you induce some sort of computational fault after computing this nonce. So you will have what looks like a different message, so you will have a nonce reuse for different message and you can recover the key. Now this scenario was already explored for elliptic curve-based schemes, but then we have to ask you questions, is it specific to elliptic curves, or can we do it on other schemes as well? And that's, of course, where the lattices come in. So what we do is we extend uh, differential fault attacks to deterministic lattice signatures, namely to dilithium, you should have heard of dilithium, and to Q-Tesla. Uh, both of which were submitted to the NIST competition, or NIST call, and uh, are both deterministic. Uh, now that such differential fault attacks are possible here isn't all that surprising given that the lithium and Q-Tesla share some design similarities to their elliptic curve counterparts, but there are some design peculiarities that set them apart from ECC, like for instance, rejection sampling, key compression, and it's also possible to, to derive some more efficient uh, and new attack paths, like efficient exploitation of partial nonce reuse. Okay, so in this work, we focus on mainly the, the lithium, um, which is why I'm not going to explain it very little, so you've already heard some stuff, just some things that have not been said yet. Uh, but all our attacks carry over to Q-Tesla as well in a quite straightforward manner. They, both signature schemes are, are somewhat uh, similar. Now, the lithium is based on a module LWE assumption, so it has polynomials with some base ring, which is at least for lattice-based uh, lattice cryptography, somewhat small, and then it works with vectors and matrices of these polynomials. So in key generation, you have two uh, vectors of polynomials with somewhat small coefficients, so they're in a specific range, and you have a random and public A, so a matrix of polynomial, and the public key is A, S1 plus S2. So uh, wasn't ha what hasn't been said yet in the previous presentation is that it uses determinism to protect against randomness. Not only that, but I'll come to that later. Okay, so this is the main framework of the lithium. So first, what the first do is you sample this nonce Y in a deterministic fashion. So you can also call this the noise, whatever you fancy. Uh, then you multiply it with this A, uh, hash it together with the message uh, to get the C, and then you compute Z equals Y plus C, C, S1. So in other words, it's a Fiatschermier-Schnorr-like signature scheme. But what's uh, new in the lithium, or what's, what's common in many uh, lattice-based signatures, is this rejection sampling, so where you uh, test if your output Z uh, follows some distribution, and uh, if it doesn't, then you re re restart this whole sam uh, signing process, and in the lithium, this rejection sampling is essentially just an, a coefficient-wise uh, range check. Now, 
since uh, this, this, this sampling of the, the nonce y is deterministic, it's easy to see that, well, if you have the same message m, you get the same y, and this is then kind of a nonce reuse. But of course, you can't use a nonce reuse if you don't uh, have anything else. You get the same output. You can't uh, extract any useful information from that. So you have to change something else, and you do this by injecting a computational fault. So in the case of the lithium, this would some look like something like this. So you have one message M. You sign this twice, once just regularly, and the second time you uh, compute the signature, but you inject a fault such that the nonce Y is identical, but that the C is something different. Then you can uh, set up these two equations, set equals Y C S1, once without fault, once with a fault, subtract one another, since y is identical, it cancels out. And then you, what, what you have left is a system in which the only unknown is the private key, so you can easily uh, recover this private key. So th that's quite similar to what happened in the ECC case. Uh, something uh, about the lithium uh, is that it uses key compression, and due to this key compression, you can't easily uh, recover this uh, second key part, S2. But in the paper, we show that uh, an attacker can still forge signatures, even if he only has access to this S1. Now, but there's one other thing we kind of forgot and skipped over, and that it's, uh, and this one thing isn't that rejection doesn't only hurt in your real life, but also for our attack. Uh, so what we have here is, uh, unlike ECC or stuff like that, you sample this nonce Y by using a hash from K, M, and some kappa. What's kappa? Kappa is a rejection counter. So uh, this counts up and is used so that you have a fresh Y in each of the uh, iteration, each time a signature gets rejected. Now, to have a non reuse, you have to, of course, use the same kappa again. This means that the key recovery is only successful if both the non-faulted execution and the faulted execution accept the signature in the same iteration. Now, but as soon as we inject a fault, we will also influence the intermediate used in the rejection conditions. So it might be that we inject a fault, and due to the faulted values, the signature is not uh, accepted anymore. Uh, and there, unlike ECC-based counterparts, uh, so here the, the fault position, which, uh, uh, which target you effectively fault, uh, determines the success probability. And we have a, a look at five uh, concrete fault scenarios, so concrete position. So the first one is the, probably the most straightforward one. You want to have a different C as challenge vector. So what do you do? You fault the computation of C, so this hashing operation here. Uh, there, uh, what you can do is observe that in this equation, z equals y plus cs1, if you have a look at the, at the distributions of these two variables, you, you'll see that, well, y is, is uh, uniformly distributed in the range of plus minus 500,000 something, and this cs1 is kind of like in the range plus minus 50 or so. So this means that using just a different C won't affect Z that much, and since the first rejection condition is a range check on C, uh, this means that if, it ex if, if the signature was accepted originally, then it will also likely be accepted uh, with a different C. So this means we have a success probability of over 90%. So, but it's not only the direct computation of C that we can fault, we can also fault any, any result that goes into this, like, for instance, the computation of this W, so of the polynomial multiplication. Uh, this multiplication uses the entity, you've already heard of that, and so the entity is a, an FFT over a prime field, uh, so it uses the same uh, implementation techniques, butterflies, butterfly network and stuff. And there, if you have a look at this butterfly network, it's quite easy to see if, if you inject a fault 
on the left side, on the input of this, then a fault will spread to all of the output coefficients, whereas you fault on the right, on the output, only a couple of coefficients will be affected. And the more uh, coefficients you change, the more likely it will that, uh, that your new signature, your faulted signature, gets rejected. So you have a success probability between 25 and 90%. On, depends on what you exactly fault, but overall, of course, this multiplication is a larger target than the hashing. Okay, then we can also fault the public key, so this loading of the A. There we have two sub-scenarios, because this A is not stored directly, but generated from some seed, and you can either attack this row directly, this value, or the extendable output function. So uh, depending on what you fault, you are between 25 or 54 percent. But what's, the, uh, what's interesting here is if you inject a fault into row, you can think of, yeah, maybe that could be also be a permanent fault. And finally, uh, a somewhat different scenario is that you fault the nonce. Why? What? If we fault the nonce, then the output will be different, so it's not a nonce we use anymore. Yes, but what we do is we target a partial nonce reuse. So the, the nonce is somewhat similar to the original one, but not the same. There we exploit that uh, the lithium uses the shake XOF quite extensively. And if you have a look at this sponge structure, well, it's easy to see that if you inject a fault lag, for instance, in the second application of Ketchak F in the squeeze phase, then all the output coming before that, H0 and H1, will be the same. Uh, and everything behind that will be different. So, and as uh, Y is sampled from this output, we then have uh, two different ve uh, vectors y, where the first couple of coefficients will be identical, so the difference is zero, and only the last couple of coefficients will be different. But still, this difference is way too large to, uh, to only apply brute force. So what we do is we, we turn this problem of key recovery to a lattice problem, where we have some target t, which is computed from uh, public uh, output, from the public signature, and then we can look for the key or then we have a, a closest vector problem, so we look for a vector close to the lattice generated by this term, and, the diff and we know that it's close because the difference between the target and the lattice point is exactly our key that has small coefficients. Of course, we have to apply some restrictions on the fold, so we can fold two out of the five Ketchak F permutations that are needed in the squeeze phase. Uh, and the computational runtime of the lattice reduction is below one minute, and we have a success probability of 24%. Okay, so we did simulations, but we also did experimental verifications. So we uh, uh, did clock glitches on an ARM Cortex M4, and for each of the fault scenarios, a single random fault is sufficient. Uh, and what we also did is that we, uh, we benchmarked the runtime of all the different scenarios, so how much of our signing time is susceptible to a fault. And there you can see that, well, faulting the hash directly has a high success probability, but it's, it's a kind of a small target. And the, the uh, expansion of the public key takes quite a lot of time, doesn't have that high of a success probability, but appears to be a good target. And for this FW, we just did uh, many uh, real experiments and then uh, get, uh, got the average uh, success probability of about 0.6 or so. Okay, so now that we have the attack, we can think about countermeasures in terms of the generic countermeasures. Of course, the first thing that comes to mind is double computation, adds the run, uh, doubles the runtime, of course. And to attack double computation, you need to either inject the same fault twice, or you have some permanent fault, like for instance, if you are able to manipulate this seed. Now, uh, since uh, verification is quite a lot faster than, than uh, signing, what you can alternatively do is you, you take the signature you get and then verify. So this takes only about one quarter of the runtime. But what's interesting here is that, well, if you fault the generation of the nonce, 
all, all what you do is you sign with a different nonce and the, that's still a valid signature. So using this scenario, you can bypass this countermeasure. And a final countermeasure that uh, can protect against all our scenarios and has hardly any overhead is what we call additional randomness. So what you do is you don't only uh, output K, M, and couple to this deterministic sample, but also some random R, like a random bit string. Now, this protects against uh, fault attacks, against bad randomness, because if you insert, uh, if you set R to be a constant, all you do is uh, switch off the fault countermeasure again. And if you do it correctly, it could also be used against some sort of countermeasure against DPA recovery of this secret K. Uh, and in fact, Q Tesla uh, already added this countermeasure. So, in an update uh, that came after the initial publication of this work, they, made, they added this countermeasure, and it's now mandatory. So, the attacks don't apply anymore. Uh, and that's why I had a star next to Q Tesla in the beginning. Uh, with the lithium, there is a little bit of a problem because the actual security proof that the lithium uses requires this determinism. So the proof requires that the signature scheme is deterministic and it loses tightness with the... Uh, there is a, an alternative version that doesn't require this determinism, but it's not tight and it loses uh, security in the number of, of, of signatures that you see per message. So that's a bit of a problem. So if this then really contributes to attack, it's of course an open problem, but yeah, it still violates some security guarantees. Okay, that's then the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for attention. Any questions for Peter? So maybe one for me. So on slide 13, I think it was. So you showed these, yeah, these different attacks and the, how much time they take for yeah. the total signature time. So if I just, I'm not targeting anything. I just let it run and I yeah. shoot a, a fault. Yeah, that's that's there. Yeah, that's, that's, the the that's the total. Yeah, so that's like about 30% of the runtime. So if you really blindly just shoot at the thing, but uh, you can be more. Uh, Targeted, like for instance, this expansion of the of the pr public key will always be somewhere at the beginning. So if you target this, then you will probably have a higher higher success. And then yeah, with chance one in two, slightly above, yeah, yeah. you will succeed. All right. And then next slide, you said like if you add randomness, um, I agree that it's a good countermeasure. But why doesn't that add anything to the runtime? Getting Good quality randomness can be yeah, quite expensive. Yeah, of course. Uh, getting randomness isn't uh, if you have it somewhere ready. Yes, so of course that's okay. <laughs> Zero percent is if you have it ready and everything else is already set up. If you have a hardware RNG or I don't know what, okay. it will add something because if you want to also protect against DPA, you will likely uh, fill the first block of shake with random stuff, and uh, so it will have a higher runtime, but uh, negligible compared to the other, other stuff. OK. Any more questions? If not, let's thanks Peter and uh, all the other speakers in this session. <laughs> <laughs>